and then we'll try to get going with what we were stopping with last time was this independent samples t-test. And I think maybe in the compendium I'd call it two sample t-test. But probably this is maybe a better name actually. Well, um, so let's just review very briefly. So the deal here is that we um, We are considering two populations, and we have a variable that we observe in both populations. And then there's a mean of, so say, yeah. well, let's just say it like this. We compare a mean value in, in two different populations. So, and the idea is then, suppose this is, uh, yeah. So we take some small samples out of each and observe an x bar and a standard deviation here. We observe a y bar and a standard deviation for these two populations. And we are interested in testing some kind of hypothesis regarding the d possible difference between these two mean values. Okay, so I'm just reviewing. Um, and of course, we observe and compare basically those sample averages. And you find something like that. And typically, the The null hypothesis would state that those two means are equal, while the alternative could be one-sided or two-sided. So a two-sided alternative just looks for evidence for a difference between the means based on, on sample data. <laughs> And as always, we want to do a test. So we have this machinery that is always coming along with the test. You take your samples, and you have to compute something. And that something would be a test statistic. So just reminding you, a test statistic is the key that unlocks the hypothesis test in a way. So it has two features. It must have a known distribution. Given the truth of H0. And secondly, it must be computable uh, from data, I would say, or from the samples. So it should have a known distribution, and then we should be able to compute some value from the sample, which we can then compare to this given distribution under H0. And in this, for this particular test, we usually have a test statistic that we call t, which is basically, of course, we have to look at the difference between the sample means. But not only that, we have to compare that in relation to something involving both the standard deviations. OK, I put a square on this. That was not 
necessarily a good idea. Um, and possible different sample sizes. So in a way to decide whether this is a small or big difference, it has to be also considered given the standard deviations and the sample sizes. And this happens automatically by observing. OK, I, I realize I'm not consistent with my notation here. I use sometimes small letter Y and X and sometimes capital. So let's keep to the small letters now. X bar minus Y bar and then this strange little square root here. Yeah, so it's this guy. Okay, and then the, the result was basically like this. Um, we were working under an assumption that the samples were not too small. So and small in sample size in statistics very often means greater than 30. So we use a T distribution. For this T, given H0 is true. So the answer to the first question in this case is, is T distribution here. Degrees of freedom is complicated actually in general, but we don't need to know it. <laughs> it's more than 30, which means we for hand calculations we can always resort to the standard normal as an approximation. Okay. Um, yeah, and if we use SPSS, it will give you p-values that are based on the perfect true t distribution. But then SPSS takes care of everything. We just have to interpret the the result. Uh, so we did some examples. I will show you even one more example. I hope in the later in the lecture. But uh, just to review what we do in SPSS with this thing is um, I can just redo this example that we did in the end very quickly last time. So here is typically how you have this data. Um, so you have in some way a variable down there. Here it's called inactive. And then you have a grouping variable. So in this case, it's a So um, it's managed slightly differently in, in SPSS because uh, we can say we have um, all the data are in, sort of in one column. And then the, the dif distinction between groups is made by the second grouping variable. So when you use SPSS, it will compute one sample mean for the A data here, for A data, and one for B data. Um, 
And then it will compute this test statistic here and give you the observed value and then use this distribution to cook up some p-value for it. Okay. And the choice is here down where it says analyze and compare means independent samples t-test. So here you say what is the variable that you want to test. So let's just review what was this all about. It was about the, the period the patient needed to be inactive after an operation performed at two different hospitals with two different routines. So these are mainly days of inactivity after this operation. So there are some variations, and we would like to see if one of them, on average, is uh, significantly better. So this is our test variable, is this measurement, and then which groups uh, am I looking at? Well, it's this hospital variable. Um, like this, and then, as I said, you need to actually specify that one group is A, one group is B. And that's about it. And then we get the output, which is fairly huge. Um, so like we said last time, um, there's a mean for A at about 14.0, and there's a mean for B at about 15.10, so it's a little bit more than one day in average. Um, and then the question is still, is this significant or not? So that has to do with uh, looking at this guy. And then there's this horrible table, um, which I can make maybe. So the resolution of the screen here is a little bit um, unfortunate. So let me. It's possible to actually use this editor and just kill some of it. my screen in my office is a little bit wider so it looks a little bit better than this but um, yeah, you can do something like this then close and then we at least get to see the whole whole table and trying to make it as little complicated as possible there are two lines of information here but we can more or less safely just read the lower line of data or the of the output. Um, so actually this concerns two variants of these tests and in fact I would claim that if there is a difference in the result here then the lower one is the correct one. And otherwise, there may be formal reasons for using the first line, but then they would all almost, or I would say, always be equal to many decimals. So it's a slight shortcut, but it's going to work very well. I can, I can tell you very briefly what it's about, actually. The difference between the two tests is based on whether these uh, variations in the two groups are the same or not. So in some cases you might compare means from one population with very small variance to the mean of a population with very huge variance and then uh, 
some modifications would be, be we have to be done. But to avoid this, this technical distinction, let's just stick to the second line here and, and work on that. So what do you get? Um, the T here is what we usually call the T-OPS. And it's um, minus 2.7. The degrees of freedom is not something we need to care about. You can observe that it's a high number. It's so close to 100. Slightly different, 98 and 97.86, but that's not much. But the important thing is the p-value, which is here in the sig column. And it's about 0 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0 0.0 8, right. Now, this is what I call a low p-value. If we say that our general limit is 0 0.05. So our rule is basically to reject H0. So this data, they really do point to a significant difference in the means here. And it's in favor of the group A. Since here it's an advantage to have a uh, shorter number of days. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not the right note. So I mean, you're going to work on that in these exercises and get some training. Just note very importantly once again. that SPSS, it, it never asked me whether I was doing a one-sided or a two-sided test and which side I was looking at. So it always gives you the two-sided p-value. Gives p-value, it gives, <laughs> assuming H1 says mu x different from mu y. And as you remember, the computation of p-values for two-sided, you take your observed value, you look at this probability in the extreme, and multiply it by two, or you take <coughs> two sides when it's a two-sided test. If one-sided, we need to be careful to check that uh, the difference between x-bar and y-bar actually points to h1 in the first place, right? Check. Uh, X bar, or yeah, what can we say? X bar minus Y bar is on the critical side. And now I'm making a little bit of mess here. And then 
half of the SPSS p value. So what do I mean by this? Just reviewing Ooh, briefly. Um, suppose you have a one-sided thing like this. And you observe in one case x bar and y bar here. Then this is on the critical side. Because to, to sort of believe in this one, you would have to see an x average a bit lower than the y average. And then you use SPSS to assert the significance. But suppose it was this way on the other hand. Then this points to the opposite direction of H1, actually. So no indication of. So I would say here use SPSS p value and half of it, but here ignore SPSS p value. But note carefully that SPSS will give you exactly the same p-value for these two outcomes, because SPSS always computes two-sided. So they say that these are equally critical. Yeah. So it should be fairly easy to use, only if you grasp this little detail about the one-sided test. So in fact, we need only care about these three numbers, or these two actually, the t observed and ultimately the p value. That's what we need from this test. OK. happened here. Yeah. So I'm in the note that's called um, Chapter 3, note 2. This is where we stopped more or less last week. Um, yeah. OK, so let's see. Now we've done a few tests here. We've done the one sample t test, and we did the two sample t test. And we always assumed um, sample sizes larger than 30. Um, and then we put up t statistics, for instance, in a 
long sample t-test, it looks something like this. And then we say, OK, given h0, if this is true, then then t has a certain t distribution which we can use to to analyze it. In this case, the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Uh, yeah, and we frequently approximated this thing with a standard normal distribution also in the large sample case. OK, so when what happens when the samples are not large? Well, we will actually do more or less the same thing, but we have to restrict a little bit the, the possible application of the test. Two cases where our initial data are really actually normally distributed. So it says here we use the same procedure with a t-test, but we assume individual data come from normal distribution. And secondly, we can no longer use the normal approximation to, for instance, compute p-values. So what does the first assumption mean? Well, recall what we are doing. We are actually looking at the population. We are talking about the mu. But what is mu? We are looking at objects here, but ultimately we are looking at some variable. <laughs> For instance, the monthly cell phone spending, mobile phone spending for students. So here are students, Norwegian, or students at Norwegian colleges and universities. And the variable is monthly spending. And we would consider the parameter mu, which is the expected value. And then you can find confidence intervals. You can do testing and so on. Um, and so far, we have just done it. We have never talked about this variable or the distribution of that variable. So the results have been valid no, uh, no matter what this distribution is. But for small samples, we need to consider Actually, what is the probability distribution of the basic variable that we're looking at? Hmm? So it's not longer generally applicable, but we have to have some reasonable belief that this is uh, a normal variable. OK. But how do we know that? Suppose this is monthly spending for students. How can I know whether this is normally distributed or not? I could guess I could go to literature and look at similar analysis. Have anyone investigated it? But more importantly, we will have actually a sample. OK. So we're going to use this sample, of course, to estimate uh, and to test hypothesis. But we can also say something more. OK, so we have n observations. And to look, I mean, looking at the sample, how the data are distributed, should tell me something about whether 
the distribution is normal or not. So to put it simple, suppose my data looks like this. Would I guess that this is come from a normal distribution? Hardly, because it's very skewed. Hmm? There's a bunch of values. It's like income data. It's a bunch of values down here, and then a few large ones. So it should rather look something like this. Then probably it looks a little bit more normal. But of course, this is not scientific. You cannot draw this picture and say, oh, this is normal, but this is not. So there are some ways of handling this. So before I move to that, let's just say it like this. We need, if for small samples, we need to check this assumption. And we'll do it with SPSS. And for the second case, we won't do any hand calculation in this course using small samples. We'll just. In case we, we meet it, we'll use SPSS to handle the p-values and stuff. Okay. So actually, what we can do in SPSS is to start the whole process by testing. Okay. So we have this situation, we have maybe a small sample, or we have some other method requiring normal data. Um, so the question is, do these data come from some normal distribution? Yeah, the way we do this is actually to start with a sort of preliminary hypothesis test where the null hypothesis says, OK, yeah, data are from some n mu sigma distribution. And we don't. We just ask if they are normal or not. We don't specify values for these in this case. Um, so you look at your sample. And then there are two ways of checking this, which is often done which are often done simultaneously. There are cer certain formal tests, which means uh, what can we call it? Um, K for Kolmogorov is a test statistic. And we don't need to know the detail about that, but it's just something that we can compute, which should be of a certain value if the data are normal, or it should have a certain distribution if data are normal. And if not, if, if the value of this is sort of strikingly different from what we should expect, then we reject this one. So I'm, I'm going to just write. in standard way. Which means it leads to a p-value. And if the p-value is low, reject h0. Um, 
So I'm hiding details from you, uh, <laughs> partly because I don't know them too well at the moment, and partly because you don't need them also. Um, so it's just a test, and it com comes out with a p-value. It's actually two tests that are done in SPSS. One is called kolmogorov Shmirnov, and the other is Shapiro-Wilk or something. And both of them gives a p-value. And if at least one of them is low, you can start to question this null hypothesis. And then secondly, before we take a break, there's this thing called a normal plot. So what is a normal plot? Well, it's simply like this. You have a kind of a scatter plot where you put your data here, ordered, and you put an ideal normal data here. Um, right, so here there is some way to to create, say, if you have like 10 data points, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I need two more. Yeah, okay, we can go below here, it doesn't matter. So One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so this is one. So let's assume that this is an ideal normal data. This is the perfect sample from a, of ten points from a normal distribution. So suppose your data is somewhat normal. It could be quite one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is not perfectly normal, but it's not so bad. So take the lowest and plot to the lowest ideal. Then take the second, plot to the second ideal. Then proceed to the third, to the fourth, uh, to the fifth, here, sixth, seventh, eighth, uh, well, maybe I missed one point. It's not so important. Uh, what you see here now is actually that uh, the points here, they are sort of piling up on a straight line, right? So with some random variation, because this is not ideal, but it's statistical variation, you see some kind of straight line pattern here. So that indicates a normal sample. On the other hand, let's do another sample. Uh, let's do something that looks very non-normal. So it's bulking down here. One, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now plot against the ideal sample. The smallest to the smallest. Second smallest to the second smallest. Third to the third. 4 to the 4, 5 to the 5th, 6 to the 6, and then you see 7 to 7, 8 to 8, 9 to 9, and 10 to uh, 10. Up there. So. You see this thing there? So this very simple uh, method, it gives you a striking illustration often that the data are really not normal. They are clumping in some places and stretching in other places, unlike a normal distribution. Um, 
Yeah, so we're going to take a break, then I will show you how we do this with SPSS. And then I need to make some decisions where we go further because we have not as much time as we could have used. Okay.